Welcome. This lecture is being given in support of English Olympiad students. Those of you who are writing the National English Olympiad exam for SACI, the South African Council of English Education. It is one of two lectures. The details may be found below and also on my website, formuse.org. The title of this year's anthology is Now and Then. The title immediately suggests the passage of time, history, memory. The anthology offers a range of voices exploring this concept through a very personal medium of autobiography and memoir. Which would you choose to write? If there's an historian in you, you may lean towards autobiography. It's more fact-driven, detailed. If you're more of a poet, you may choose to write a memoir. The word memoir literally comes from a French word meaning memory. Many great mem memoirs have come from dark times, oppressive times. It is a more flexible space, allowing the writer to focus on a particular memory or a string of memories and it invites greater variations in form and style. When I flick through the pages of this anthology, there is an image that stands out for me. It is the image of the grandmother in Eskia Mapalele's 1959 autobiography, Down Second Avenue. We all have grandmothers, but what image do you carry around with you? of your grandmother. For Eskia Mpelele, the memory of his grandmother was intricately interwoven with a traumatic move. Chapter 1 of Down Second Avenue on page 3 begins I have never known why we, my brother, sister and I, were taken to the country when I was five. We went to live with our grandmother, paternal grandmother. My father and mother remained in Pretoria, where they both worked. My father a shop messenger in an outfitter's firm, mother as a domestic servant. That was the autumn of 1924. There is a sense of being displaced without knowing why. It is as if his secure childhood with his mother and father was suddenly 
wiped out, lost. He actually says, I remember feeling quite lost in that little village of Maupaneng. The terrible gnawing sense of loss may be seen as his first experience of exile. But it is his grandmother who looms large in his mind. My grandmother sat there under a small lemon tree next to the hut as big as fate, as forbidding as a mountain, stern as a mimosa tree. In contrast to the small lemon tree and hut, she is as big as fate. She seems to have complete control over his life. There is nothing small about his grandmother. She seems as forbidding as a mountain. There is nothing warm or nurturing about her. And he sums her up in epigrammatic form saying, she was not the smiling type. He even claims that my granny seemed to conspire with the mountain and the dark to frighten us. These are the fixed impressions forged in the crucible of childhood that suggest his longing for nurturing and affection and evoke a sense of pathos in the reader. Where Mapalele captures the feelings of fear and sadness a child has, suddenly being sent to live in the rural areas with his grandmother, Yet, it is remarkable that the small boy is able to deal with the loss of his parents, his home, endure a grandmother who is acerbic, and still enjoy taking the two goats out every day. He remembers that it was great fun feeling the tickling sensation in our hands as the creatures nibbled at the leaves without falling into despair. His story shows the resilience and endurance of a child coping in a difficult situation of loss, change, and fragmentation of a stable home. Instead, Sindiwe Magona gives a different perspective in her autobiography to My Children's Children. It was published in 1990, but written about childhood in the 1940s. She imagines herself to be a great grandmother and her autobiography is written in the form of a letter to her great granddaughter. The autobiography appears on page seven. When I am old, wrinkled and grey, what shall I tell you, my great-granddaughter, 
What memories will stay with me of days of yesteryear? Of my childhood, what shall I remember? What of my young womanhood, my wifehood, my motherhood? Work has been a big part of my life. Of that, what memories will linger? What nightmares haunt me forever? How will you know who you are if I do not or cannot tell you the story of your past? In contrast to Mapalele's impression of his grandmother as hard and unyielding, the impression we get of this imaginary great-grandmother is one of a nurturing person whose care is limitless, extending even to her great-grandchildren as yet unborn. She wishes to leave her story to future generations so that they may know who they are. This portrayal may well have emerged from her happy recollections of herself on page 8. She says, my recollections of myself as a little girl of three or four revolve around my great-grandmother, Noputukezi, my two grandmothers, my mother, and my maternal grandfather. This point of view allows the reader to engage with the story of this imaginary great-grandmother, to walk in her shoes, to experience the apartheid world where the mines and the farms and industrial complexes swallow the men of the village, where her father's visits were too brief for her to get to know him so that they didn't even call him Tata Father. He was called Buti, older brother. She deliberately chose to present herself as an ordinary person as she unfolds her story. The tumultuous, oppressive time of apartheid was a time of terrible dislocation for black and coloured people whose land was redistributed and whose families were shattered with parents, especially fathers, working far from home. But Magona redefined home, not as a physical place, but as the people you cared about and who cared about you. She redefines home in the form of the enduring love and care of her extended family. In fact, Magona's writing is a blend of past and present and possible future. It is this interconnectedness that gives her strength and resilience. She draws from her Isikosa beliefs and tales, but views it 
as existing alongside the modern system where she acquired knowledge from school. Even storytelling was learnt in my family, she tells us. The outstanding storytellers of my childhood were my maternal grandmother, a paternal uncle, Masondo, and a cousin, Sondlo, where a modern feminist may question the traditional gender roles in their play by the river, with the boys hunting and the girls gathering berries. For Magona, the traditional stories are all part of a continuum of time in which she is able to rise up in an oppressive time to tell her story. To stop authentic stories from being obliterated or rewritten. Histories were rewritten as they are wont to be in bleak authoritarian times. Magona admits in a conversation with Salo 2009 that her inspiration for writing emerged from anger. I experienced anger about others writing about us. I told myself that shouldn't stop me from writing about myself. Her refusal to remain silent and her determination is revealed on page seven. She says, as ours is an oral tradition, I would like you to hear it from my lips, what it was like living in the 1940s onwards, what it was like in the times of your great, great grandmother, me. However, my people are no longer living long lives. Generations no longer set eyes on one another. Therefore, I fear I may not live long enough to do my duty to you, to let you know who you are and whence you are. So I will keep for you my words in this manner. In this way, autobiography gave her a space for a voice of a black woman so often demeaned and silenced under apartheid to be heard so that she may not only leave her words for future generations, but in doing so, contribute to shaping the world so that future generations may not have to experience what she did. Perhaps a more realistic appraisal of the matriarchal figure than in either down Second Avenue or for my children's children may be seen in Songs for Sarah, published in 2017, in which <coughs> Professor Janssen pays tribute to his own mother 
and the other mothers on the Cape Flats. When you think about it, everything seems to work against the Cape Flat mothers, from family dislocation to financial hardship to absentee fathers to relentless pressure of gangs and drugs. How on earth do these mothers do it? In Professor Janssen's memoir, the practical common sense, strong values and belief in hard work of his mother is brought beautifully together in one of Sarah's favourite phrases. While you are under my roof, my mother would chide, you will do as I say. The same functioned both practically and metaphorically. Sarah knew that she would have little control over what happened in the harsh world outside. We would all grow up one day and make our own decisions as working adults and parents. There was little my mother could do to change that. But while under her roof, her rules applied. The endless chores, the long trips to church, twice every Sunday were harsh, but under her roof, Sarah's family were together as one. And he concludes on page 49, he concludes, the lessons of Sarah were not easy, but they made a difference. Under her roof, the children were safe. Outside her influence, danger lurked around every corner. The gangs were everywhere. So it is that in the corner house, Sarah creates a wonderful, palpable sense of belonging and protection. Sarah provides a metaphorical map which helps in the making of right decisions because, as Janssen concludes, Sarah did not raise scorns. Where Janssen and Magorna had homes or communities to which they felt they belonged. Early on, Mpelele experienced a sense of exile, of being ousted from his home and the pain of that experience was repeated and amplified several times throughout his life. Dante Alighieri was a great Italian poet from the Middle Ages who wrote the Divine Comedy comprising Inferno, Hell, Purgatorio, Purgatory, and Paradiso, Heaven. He was ousted from his beloved home, Florence. He speaks of the pain of exile in the inferno. 
Take joy, O Florence, for you are so great. Your wings beat over land and sea. Your fame resounds through hell. This is from Inferno 26. He sees Florence as a fallen city. And part of what he does in the Commedia is to transcend it by journeying towards a heavenly home. There is certainly a sense of hell in Mpulele's experiences of exile, going beyond the given extract in the anthology, probing more deeply through his autobiographies, one repeatedly becomes aware of the painful experience of exile. This is uppermost in the work of Mpulele. Frequently, there is a sense of pathos in his memoir. But despite this, he repeatedly goes back to Mapuang. He says, The memories of Mapuang come back to me now and again. And then I feel no nostalgia for that time of my life the kind of nostalgia I felt for Marabastat. And yet, I keep going to the district to recollect my unprotected life as a herd boy, sniffing for old smells, listening to the old bird calls and insect sounds. It is almost as if, despite the pain of loss, he continues to revisit the place in his mind, as if it is a place of origin, the first home he can recall, however traumatic his stay there was. The first step he took towards exile was a move to Lesotho, then called Basutiland, for a short time. He said he went there in search of something. What it was, I didn't know, but it was there where it wasn't inside me. When you take your first step into exile, you take on the universe. But it was only when he took his one-way ticket out of South Africa that the enormity of what he had done struck him. Against all odds, in country upon country, Nigeria, Paris, Uganda, Ghana, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Kenya, America. He won countless accolades. His star-studded career skyrocketed. His longing to teach was fulfilled at the highest level as Professor of English at Pennsylvania University. This is quite unexpected and ironic in the light of Down Second Avenue, where he admits that he hated school. He referred to it as torture, associating it with corporal punishment, and often preferred playing truant. We see this on page four in the anthology.
You're not from school today, SAP, and I can see it in your eyes, my grandmother said, looking away from the broom she was making out of grass, straight into me. I'm from there, Granny. Don't lie to me. She was in the wrong mood. I smell trouble. Just then, my uncle, who lived with us, came in. You were not in school, Eski, and you'd better not deny it, he said, towering over me like a blue gum tree. Yes, I hadn't been at school. I'd spent the day with friends up in the mountains. I paid dearly for this with a lash. Despite the enormity of his success, the song of exile filled his heart with longing. Wordsworth's solitary reaper conveys the universal song of longing for one's homeland. Let's read it. The Solitary Reaper by William Wordsworth. Behold her, single in the field, yon solitary highland lass, reaping and singing to herself, stop here or gently pass. Alone she cuts and binds the grain, and sings a melancholy strain. Oh, listen! For the veil profound is overflowing with the sound. No nightingale did ever chant more welcome notes to weary bands of travellers in some shady haunt among Arabian sands. A voice so thrilling ne'er was heard in springtime from the cuckoo bird, breaking the silence of the seas among the farthest Hebrides. Will no one tell me what she sings? Perhaps the plaintive numbers flow for old, unhappy, far-off things and battles long ago. Or is it some more humble lay, familiar matter of today, some natural sorrow, loss or pain, that has been and may be again? Whatever the theme the maiden sang, as if her song could have no ending, I saw her singing at her work and o'er the sickle bending. I listened, motionless and still. And as I mounted up the hill, the music in my heart I bore. Long after, it was heard no more. Wordsworth's solitary reaper conveys the universal song of longing for one's homeland. This same sense of alienation and utter longing fills Mpulele's heart as he is driven home. Perhaps he needed to travel from country to country 
and across continents, only to realize what was always there within him. Home. His final poem, A Prayer, was written about his final return to his home country, South Africa, after 19 years of exile from the homeland. 19 years I've roamed the continents, renting one glass house after another, whence I've gazed and gazed upon the wilderness of exile. All around me, still turning around in circles, sowing seeds on borrowed land. For crops, we'll always have to leave behind. Well, Nothing remains but for me to wish you all lots of luck for your upcoming exam. If your schools would like to book an extra lecture, then the details are below and also, of course, on my website, formuse.org.